So this is going to be a talk about influence and about leadership. But if I pretend to know anything about this topic, um, I need to share a story, a true story, a kind of sad story. It's a story about, it's a story about how I got uh, kicked out of a party, a birthday party, when I was 11. Um, I call it the long way home. Um, so I, uh, it's all because of this, really. It's, it's a snack. It's, it's called Bamba. I, so I came to this party. It all went, uh, it was nice at first. We were, we were talking, we, me and my friends. And then someone turned on the music. And then girls and boys started dancing. And I, and I hated dancing. Okay? I, still, I still hate dancing. And I had absolutely no idea how to approach girls, which is an issue. It took me years to resolve that issue. So anyway, I didn't have much choice there. So I just stood there and threw Bamba at the other kids. I thought it was kind of cool and funny, you know. And the other kids didn't uh, think the same. Uh, it, what made things worse is that I didn't stop when they asked me to. Yeah? <laughs> so they threw me out, basically. Uh, which is kind of embarrassing. It was early, still. Uh, I didn't feel like sharing this with my family. It's not a success story. So I took the long way home. And I had a lot of time to think. And in my thinking, I got to the conclusion that I am not good with people. So um, later this year, that year, my parents bought this computer. This became my first computer. I really loved it. It's much easier to influence a computer than a, user being, than a human being, right? This became my comfort zone. I pretty much stopped going to parties around that time. And I felt the superpower of a developer, right? Because a developer can, can do things that other people cannot do, right? And a developer is the, is the absolute expert. Because no one knows my code better than I, than I know it, right? And this superpower served me very well over many years as a developer, as a, as a, as a team leader, as a manager. And then, but I, when I gravitated towards software architecture and, and expanded my responsibilities, I gradually found that it was, it was just not enough. Right? So um, fast forward like 30 years, um, I, I get this project. It's a large scale integration project. It's multiple data centers around the world. It's cloud, things I'm not experienced with. Uh, the scope is not clear. Requirements are not clear. If my stakeholders are in five different locations. I, I don't know most of them. Okay. So uh, it was. I felt like everyone has a piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, I don't know which. I don't know who are, who are the people who hold these pieces, right? But this is how it felt. I need to bring them together somehow. And build this jigsaw puzzle. Uh, so I knew I need to uh, um, encourage collaboration there, and I think this is what we want uh, as software architects, right? We want to. Uh, provide a design or at least guidelines, and then we want the teams to somehow make it a reality. But it doesn't always work this way, right? They don't always act like we expect. They don't always get the benefits. Okay, so and so why don't they understand? Sometimes they don't understand. And I realized that understanding is not just a, a, about rational arguments. It's very much emotional. I see it all the time. I see it with my son. He's six years old. He reads. Right? So when, he, when he, so he reads a book and he sees a word he doesn't understand, so he says, Dad, what, what does it mean? And he gets all serious. And then I explain the meaning of the word. And then he smiles. Right? Or he even laughs. Right? Why does he laugh? It's not that the word is funny. He understands the word and it makes him feel good about himself. Right? And it also makes people feel good if they're understood. So my wife, I, she always expects me to do things without asking me. Right? <laughs> so, is, uh, uh, maybe all women are like this. I don't know. Um, so she wants me to somehow understand intuitively what she needs. So to her, understanding is, is a symbol of love. right? So there's a, an emotional need to be understood. We want to tap into this need. Um, this is my advice to you. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. It's taken from this excellent book. I highly recommend it. It's called The Seven uh, Habits of Highly Effective People. 
And so I make it my business to uh, learn the goals and concerns of, of stakeholders, of people. Okay, I won't even use the naming stakeholders. Uh, whenever someone offers me their goal or their concern, I can connect with them on the basis of this concern. Okay. So here's another story. I was selling a used car a few years back, and I'm bad at selling anything. So my brother-in-law, David, he's excellent at selling. So he's, he helps me out. So this buyer came, he wanted the car, but then he hesitated because there was a scratch on the car exterior. So we asked, uh, what, am, what am I gonna do about the car, about the scratch? And in my opinion, a scratch is really not a big deal. I was uh, ready to give him a discount for it. I'd, so I told him, you know, it, it's not really important, right? Let's talk about the money, okay? But David knows how to connect with the guy. So he immediately assured him that the scratch can be fixed. He told him where he needs to go to fix the scratch. He told him how much it's gonna cost. Okay? And then something miraculous happened. I became invisible. Okay? <laughs> Or at least this is how it, how it felt, right? Because they uh, were talking to one another, right? David became the influencer, it was very obvious. I became the guy who doesn't care and doesn't help, right? So the theory is we first show people we understand, we, we, we care about, what, about, about them, we hear them, and then we create a space in which they are open to hearing what we have to say. This is how I like to uh, put it to practice. So I do a lot of remote meetings, and I just share a text editor, and I um, summarize what people are saying. Okay? So there's the name of the person, and their idea or their opinion. And this has a great, so this is in, in real time, right? This has great benefits. So first of all, it forces me to understand. If I, if I don't get it right, then people will uh, correct me. And, which is great, and then, and then there's no misunderstanding, okay? And it, this, I show that I acknowledge people's position, people's opinion. It doesn't mean that I, that I agree, but I acknowledge it. And uh, only if you acknowledge something, you can change it, right? If I ignore it, I cannot change it. Uh, people know that they are heard. Right? Everyone on the meeting is hearing them. So this actually helps them deliver their message to the rest of the meeting participants. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing a very good service for everyone there. Now, if people's opinions, if someone's opinion is rejected in the end, they still have the satisfaction of, of being heard, of being noted, right? They know it's gonna appear in the meeting notes. They identify with, with their opinion, with their idea. So I, I, many times I get uh, this feedback after this meeting, this kind of meeting. They tell me it was a good meeting, Adi. Thanks for taking those notes. And in the end, what you see are people's names and their opinions or their ideas. You won't see my name so much. That's the point, right? It's not about me. I don't wanna put me in the center. It's about them. I wanna get them engaged. So and I'm using names here, right? But I'm using them, I'm very sensitive about this because a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. If you don't believe me, it was uh, written by Dale Carnegie okay, in this excellent book. You should read this book if you haven't, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a classic. Okay? So I will use people's names in a positive context. So I say, I'd say I really like John's idea. Right, let's go with John's idea. Or say based on a discussion with John, uh, now I realize what, what we need to do. I, I won't use it in a negative context. So if someone had an idea and it failed, I'd say, okay, we, we went with this idea. Um, it didn't work well. We have new insights. Now, now we need to change. So, it's, so, so it's now it becomes, it becomes we, right? So I, I create a space in which people know they're gonna be, um, they can contribute. It's a safe space. They, they, they'll be appreciated. They won't be crucified if they make errors. So talking about names, do you know what this couple is doing? Look, yeah, they're choosing a name together. 
Right, excellent. Um, I will want other, especially developers and, and managers, but other people in general, to choose names to components, right? Um, and in general, to contribute to the design. Because when you choose a name to a component, it's, it's a design decision, right? You draw the boundaries of the responsibility of this component. And now you kind of own it. It becomes your baby, at least, at, at least partially, right? Um, so anything I can, I can encourage there. So everything here up to, to now is very harmonious, very nice, everyone working together, right? It's not always the case. I will sometimes propose a design and I get this response. They'll tell me it's a bad design. Or they, or they will even suspect me of being lazy, of not thinking through, not caring about their system, caring only about my system, right? Um, so here is what, here's how, how I want to deal with this. Please tell me more. So if someone says it's a bad design, now I know that if I haven't listened so far, now is the time to put this person in the center of the stage. Now I'm gonna listen to them. Okay? So if someone, someone says, uh, if my system needs to call a function in your system, and your system dies, then my system doesn't work. Okay? I'll put it in terms of quality attributes. I'll say, okay, so you're concerned about availability, right? So tell me more about this. What's availability to you? Okay, how do you maintain availability? Okay, what happens if the system is not available? I'm starting to talk about this. And maybe he's right, right? Maybe this was a bad design. I won't know unless we have this open discussion. I don't want to be attached to a design, to an idea, right? I don't want to be all emotional and defensive about it. Um, so if he convinces me that it is a bad design, this is a good outcome. Because it creates a basis, a foundation of a trusting relationship. He sees, uh, he sees that I'm, I'm a reasonable guy, right? I listen, I understand. Um, this, uh, this nice guy approach doesn't mean that I'm making any compromise in the design. Right? It only means that I'm willing to talk openly about the trade-offs presented by my own idea. Right? So if someone says, uh, if we do this, then it will be hard to maintain. Right? I'll say fair enough. Here's a specific module that will be a bit harder to maintain in the presence of a, this kind of change request. Right? I'm making it now specific. Now let's talk about, let's compare trade-offs. Let's look at the other alternative. Okay? So now he, he, the other person is ready to, to speak about the other alternatives and really compare trade-offs. We don't always get to a shared opinion in the end, but the most important goal here is to get to understanding. Both sides need to understand the trade-offs. I want to talk to you a little bit about this guy. His name is Gauchi. I had worked for many years with Grouchy. <laughs> Grouchy is a negative person, okay? What, what, what does it mean? So if you come, if you come to Grouchy with two ideas, one, one is a good idea, the second is a bad idea. Okay? He's gonna say wrong, right? He's gonna ignore the good idea. He's gonna react to the mistake in the bad idea. Okay? And why is he doing this? I, I say he's negative, but he's not a bad person. He's a good person, actually the perfect intentions. He thinks he's saving the company from a very bad mistake, right? He has a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, right? but he's throwing the knowledge at you instead of sharing it. It's like throwing the, the bumper at the other kids, right? It just doesn't make, make people feel good, right? You don't want to, I mean, people like this, I, I, I will not want to talk to them unless they have to, right? So don't, so don't be this guy. I like to be this guy. Right. This guy, no matter what you tell them, they will encourage you. Right? So uh, if, you, if, you, if you give me like a, a, a good idea and a bad idea, I will first acknowledge the good idea. But not just say, yeah, well done. I will, I will specify exactly why, what quality attributes are, are increased because of this good idea. Right? And then I talk about the second idea. I will say, yeah, this is something that we actually did in the past. It's actually worked well. But here there are some requirements we need to take into consideration, so it, it won't be a good fit, right? Or I'd say, yeah, I see how, how in, 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 in such and such scenario it will be perfect. But here, uh, there's, there's a constraint, uh, it's not a good fit, right? 
And it's, it's not a subtle difference. It's very easy to spot the difference between these two guys. It's a huge difference because words can be extremely powerful. They, make, they can discourage you or, can they, or they can motivate you. And I'm gonna, I want to share with you, so encourage the heart. That's the, I want to share with you, with you a true story about the most powerful feedback I ever got in my life. Yeah? I call it 20 seconds. <laughs> I, was, I spent many years in the Army Reserve as a, as a gunner in a tank. Right? So the role of a gunner is to aim and shoot, the, the, uh, aim and fire the big gun. Uh, it takes a special skill because you only get 20 seconds to do this because you don't want the tank to be exposed to the enemy for too long. So we were in this big military exercise. It's just an exercise, but still everyone is, is very nervous, very excited, and we're waiting for the exercise to begin. And then the, then the order comes, and we, and we advance, right? And we advance until we, at some point, we see two fake enemy tanks at a distance of like two miles. Right? It took me five seconds. I fired, and I destroyed the first tank. And then 10 seconds later, I fired, and I destroyed the second tank. It was amazing. It was a thing of beauty, okay? <laughs> everyone, everyone was shouting. So, and I remember my platoon commander, he was shouting, Adi, this is amazing, how did you do it? And I told him, I said something, yeah, I got lucky. And then he said the words that I will never forget. This is the guy. He said, um, I don't know if it was luck or not, but if we ever go to war, I want you with me. Wow, it is, it's, this is amazing. I mean, if we're in a life or death situation, it's you I need. I want you, right? So he expressed his trust in me in the most profound way. It made me feel important. And we all want to feel important. And as a software architect, I will also, I have, every day, I have all kinds of opportunities to do this. If, 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 if it is like saying thank you, asking for advice from people. It could be anything. It could be, it could be testers, it could be, it could be developers, anyone, basically. I'm explaining the positive impact of what people do on the user or on me or on other systems because they don't know, really. Developers don't only know what, 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 what they're impacting, really. And I express curiosity about details with, with developers. The developers love details, right? So I, would let, I will let developers become my, my mentors. I'm also a developer. I'm really interested in this. And I need to, be, to do it consistently, because people need to see I'm committed. Commitment, I mean, they won't follow me if I'm not committed. I see, I see this at home. I would come back from work. Uh, the living room is a mess, toys all around. And I would I tell the boys, boys, you, you need to clean up the, the living room. And then they will start arguing about who's going to pick up which toy, right? So in the past, I would tell them, uh, boys, I don't care who, 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 who played with which toy. Just get it done. Right? You know what? It doesn't work. Because of the words, I don't care. Right? I don't care means I'm disengaged. I'm not committed. Right? It doesn't create motivation. It's, it's much better if I tell them, boys, mom is going to come. This is really important. We need to clean it up. Let's do this together. I'm going to do the kitchen. You're in charge of the living room. So now they have responsibility. They have a challenge to, 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 to do this in time, right? It, it works much better, it, it's fun. Um, and integrity, I, I, will, I need to admit my mistakes. Right? I will say publicly, this, I, I missed something. This was my mistake, right? I will look, I, I, will, I will do it early. Right? I, I, won't, I won't have other developers uh, catch the fire Instead of, instead of me, right? So all of these, um, I re really want to be intentional about this. And here's another great book called The Five Levels of Leadership. If you want to know where you stand on the levels of leadership, if you want to improve them, I highly recommend this book. It has a very simple model. It says uh, the lowest level is the position level. So you have a position, you're a software architect, you're a team lead, people respond to your authority, they um, basically do what they have to do. They have a job description, right? That's it. It's not fun to lead people when you're in this, uh, in, at this level. At the permission level, people have a relationship with you. People respect you. They let you guide them. They let you show the way. 
right? They want to work with you because of the, of, of, of your relationships. At the productiv productivity level, now you showed that you can get to success, right? You showed profitability. Now there's momentum. People want to join your team because of your track record. Right? And, and now it gets, it gets fun. Everyone is working together and achieving results. The people development uh, level, now you become a mentor of other, other leaders, right? It uh, reproduces, it increases your, your impact. And then at the pinnacle level, it's reserved for people like uh, Steve Jobs. They have, they transcend the organization, right? They have a vision. People follow their vision. They make big transformations. So I was reading this book. I was looking at this list and I was asking myself, okay, so what's, so what's my level? And then I, I kept on reading and it says that with every person, you're on a different level, right? So if I go and meet someone new who doesn't know me, I'm on level one, right? We don't have a relationship. And it turns out that leadership is, becomes this staircase in which you have to continue climbing with each and every individual. And all the skills we talked about so far are related to trust and uh, making people feel important. All of them are level two skills. Those are skills you need to be at level two and also to remain at level two. And I know that we, we all want to be in level three or above, right? This is where you get results, right? You want to succeed, you want to be profitable. But my point is that this is the basis. These are the fundamentals. Right? Everything relies on this. So, you, so you, will, you will benefit from this even if you are on level three with someone or level four or, or, or level five. Right? And the, all, all, everything I said so far is very easy to remember because, because all you need to remember is one thing. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Okay. So if you care about people, you know intuitively that your opportunities, your knowledge, your challenges should be shared with other people, right? Just like, just like party snacks. If you, you, probably most of you have never had Bamba in their lives. So come to me after the talk, I'll be happy to share with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Now it's time for questions. I already saw a hand going up there. I'll give you the microphone. Fantastic speech, by Thank the way. You. Uh, you had this scenario where you come up with the design and somebody says, wrong design. How do you, what are your thoughts with the flip case where somebody else is coming up with the design and it's not aligning with something, or be it even with code review? How do you put forth that they are doing something wrong, especially when you don't have authority? How do you enforce without compromising quality? Hmm, wow, that's a big question. Well, I, 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 would, I would really want, so I really be very sensitive about criticism. Right? So I would really try to establish, as much as I can, establish a relationship with this person beforehand. Uh, ideally, we already have a trusting relationship. If we have this trusting relationship, if he knows I'm not just criticizing them all the time, right? If he knows I'm a reasonable guy, uh, he can work with me, he will hear me more, right? He'll be more open to my, my ideas. Now, in some cases, the relationship is not there, the trust is not there, and the authority is not there, and I, I can't make it happen. Yeah, in some cases, yeah, it's not exact science, right? Um, do you have any tips on uh, how to change your own, one's own sort of personality? So, um, by example, I can be pretty passionate, which means I am pretty sure I come across as grouchy at times, mm. as opposed to trying to be Papa Smurf. Um, so, do you have any tips on, on what somebody can do to just check their own personality at times? Wow. 
So do you have, you have like a, a body? You can uh, be your kind of like personality coach. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so you can kind of keep you honest, mm -hmm. right? I know this uh, one person I knew, he made this checklist for himself uh, because a coach told him to do this. It's uh, say thank you to, uh, to someone once a day. So, so, so there's a checklist, right? And it, it, it's measurable. So you know exactly where you, where you, where you, um, where you lack today right, in your personality. You know what the checklist should be, right? Yeah. Just need to follow through. Hmm. Establishing awareness, I think. And yeah. It's really difficult to be aware of where you stand and who you are at the moment. When you, the yeah, I know. I was talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. So as we get into work with uh, people in significant management positions, uh, we tend to deal with a lot of high ego. How do you handle some of it? I mean, especially architects, we're more of introverts. Sometimes we tend to be more smarter, but how do you handle management people and how do you make sure that you drive decisions with them? Well, first of all, I restrain my ego. Okay, to me, an ego is something you, you, want, to, you want to get over, um, not, not work with, right? I don't want my ego in, at work. Um, but basically, I will just try to give people what they want. I mean, so on the personal level, they, they <laughs> react to the same thing. Uh, hearing them, you know, making them feel important, so what if he's a VP? He's a person, I'm a person, right? And on a practical level, I know what they want. If they want information, if they want predictability, I'm trying my best to give it to them. Right? It can be really hard. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ali, for the talk. Our next speaker did not announce himself to me before the session. Oh, but there he is coming. Welcome, Tim.